I spent a lot of time reading Kurt Vonnegut in my earlier days. He seemed like one of the few people who really got it about what was going on. And one of my favorites was Cat's Cradle. Not surprisingly, it was very contemporaneous in the Cold War culture. A master of irony and social commentary, Vonnegut often revealed a fragile world of people and drama that is, especially in this case, one dangling from the idle hands of a mad genius with weapons of mass destruction. The atomic age is born. A scientific thunderbolt gives a preview of its destructive force. In his 1963 novel Cat's Cradle, Kurt Vonnegut described Ice-9 as, quote, the last gift that Felix Honecker created for mankind before going to his just reward. On page 30, he wrote, Suppose, young man, that one marine had a guy with a tiny capsule containing a seed of Ice-9, a new way for the atoms of water to stack and lock and to freeze. If that marine threw that seed into the nearest puddle, the puddle would freeze, I guessed, and all the muck around the puddle, it would freeze, and all the puddles in the frozen muck, they would freeze, and all the pools and the streams in the frozen muck, they would freeze? You bet they would, he cried, and the United States Marines would rise up from the swamp and march on. And the rain? When it fell, it would freeze into hard little hobnobs of Ice-9, and that would be the end of the world, and the end of the interview, too. Indeed, the book was revealed to have some secrets on weather warfare that are worth paying attention to. The book was a twisted commentary on the backwardsness of the most advanced civilizations who were compelled to destroy and whose inventions and great ideas were only capable of taking life and transforming through genocidal death. Somehow, a total manipulation of the atmosphere and the weather could create a weapon far greater than a nuclear bomb. <laughs> The fictional weapon in Kurt Vonnegut's novel drew closely from Kurt Vonnegut's own acquaintance with Irving Langmuir, a chemist and Nobel Prize winning scientist who worked at the General Electric Research Laboratory. In fact, Langmuir was the first Nobel laureate to win the prize while working in the private sector rather than for a government institution. And that's the way he liked it. We are privileged now to take you to the General Electric Laboratories in Schenectady to see and hear Dr. Langmuir. Various experiments made with just apparatus just like this have proved that those layers are only one molecule thick, so that the hundred millionth of an inch really measures the size of the molecule. Bernard Vonnegut was Kurt Vonnegut's older brother and a maturing atmospheric scientist who worked closely under Irving Langmuir in the General Electric Lab. In this way, Kurt met Langmuir several times and became fascinated with him. As the star scientist at GE, Langmuir was the subject of many stories and rumors as well. Kurt Vonnegut himself worked at General Electric, probably with the job that his brother helped him to get. And before getting his best-known novels published, Kurt Vonnegut wrote press releases at GE under the company pseudonym Gregory Ellis. Apparently, there were some six Gregory Ellises in the office of Schenectady, New York. Supposedly, he quit after writing a column critical of the company, something about the blue-collar struggle at GE that the company didn't like, and he basically walked out. At any rate, Vonnegut had the opportunity to observe the man he considered to be the singular man of true genius that he knew, an extremely eccentric man who, out of absent-mindedness, seemed to think nothing of the consequences of his technology. Vonnegut said it was all just a puzzle to him. Vonnegut was later interviewed and told stories about his acquaintanceship with Langmuir. According to a 1984 article by Barbara Holliday, in Kurt Vonnegut Jr.'s Cat's Cradle, there's a character named Dr. Felix Honecker, the absent-minded scientist. Here is where he came from in Vonnegut's own words. He was a caricature of Dr. Irving Langmuir, the star of the General Electric Research Laboratory. I knew him some. My brother worked with him. Langmuir was wonderfully absent-minded. He wondered out loud one time whether, when turtles pulled in their heads, their spines buckled or contracted. I put that in the book. One time he left a tip under his plate after his wife served him breakfast at home. I put that in. Sixteen years before Cat's Cradle was published, Irving Langmuir and Bernard Vonnegut were key players in the first widespread weather experiments known as Project Cirrus, a massive operation jointly conducted in 1947 with the General Electric Laboratory, the Office of Naval Research, the U.S. Weather Bureau, the U.S. Army Signal Corps, and the Air Force. 
and as newspaper articles described during Project Cirrus, they sprayed silver iodide into a hurricane in 1947, and they did so when the hurricane was a couple days out from the East Coast trajectory, and it worked. After successfully seeding the hurricane, it changed directions and accelerated, crashing into the coast of Savannah, Georgia, wrecking major havoc on its inhabitants, destroying property, and creating an inquiry in Congress who seemed largely critical and quite perturbed at the supposition that steering this hurricane had artificially fueled it and created a loose cannon with disturbing potential consequences. The public at large was furious, lawsuits were formed, and the DOD was suddenly on the defensive. Official denials came down, attempting to quell public anger and diffuse blame. A 13-year moratorium was placed on weather experimentation, and the key players went back to the drawing board. But Irving Langmuir openly took credit for manipulating the weather and boasted about its success, tone deaf to the sentiments of the public and apparently callous to the collateral damage that this new technology was capable of wielding. During that same year, Project Cirrus also tested, quote, cloud controls to modify winter weather in the northern U.S., and Dr. Langmuir announced that he was working to prevent hailstorms during thunderstorms, the stopping of all ice storms, the freezing of rain, and cloud icing that endangers flying. Furthermore, in an April 1947 experiment that echoed the fictionalized Ice Nine of Kurt Vonnegut's novel, Langmuir described to the press his attempts at cloud cutting in the northern New York and Massachusetts Berkshire Mountain country. It was done in a cloud filled with unfrozen moisture that had been chilled to below freezing by artificially induced chemical reactions, namely by dropping some 25 pounds of dry ice from a plane into the cloud, which in turn could transform into snow or rain. The plane flew an L-shaped course, and the color of the L changed within a few minutes. Its moisture turned into snow, some of which at first boiled upwards. This kind of snow would not ice an airplane. Soon the snow fell and the L changed into a canyon in the cloud. In 30 minutes, this canyon was a thousand feet deep. This canyon widened and lengthened rapidly. It cut completely down through the cloud and was about three miles wide and lengthened to 15 miles. If a plane wants to rise through a dangerous icing cloud overhead, it could cut a hole upward by seeding the clean air directly below the cloud. This air, for some distance below, is filled with liquid moisture below freezing. When seeded, the water creates an uprush that turns the cloud above to snow. There's no danger of icing from snow. A plane opened a rift 20 miles long and 5 miles wide with dry ice. These and further experiments, which promised to alter winter weather considerably, were reported by Dr. Langmuir, Vincent J. Schaefer, Dr. Bernard Vonnegut, Raymond E. Falconer, Kia Maynard, and Robert Smith Johansson. They described subsequent experiments with silver iodide, which is more efficient, floats upward like smoke, and which will wait for the supercooled water to come to them. Ground generators of silver iodide could then decrease cloudiness and thus albedo and increase winter temperatures with heat absorbed from increased light. And that's all from 1947. Of course, they've gone on from there. Only a few years after these key initial 1947 experiments, Langmuir was in the papers again in 1955, still years before the moratorium on seeding hurricanes was lifted, and urged the U.S. to study the use of weather for war, and advocated using weather as a weapon of war for world domination. And it came out of Albuquerque, New Mexico, where Langmuir, Vonnegut, and others did a lot of weather research at the same site where the Langmuir Laboratory for Atmospheric Research was established in Langmuir's name in 1963. A 1932 Nobel Prize winner in chemistry pictured weather as a crucial weapon and declared America should be the first to be able to use that weapon. Dr. Irving Langmuir, a research consultant with the General Electric Company in Schenectady, New York, said weather modifications could cause tragic floods in an enemy country. Langmuir shocked Westerners last week with a paper in which he said he believes cloud seeding experiments in New Mexico resulted in the Missouri Valley floods of 1951. Langmuir said control of the weather would be a fearsome thing, but he added the knowledge is important even if we do not like what we discover. He said, I'm sure the Russians know this, they have our papers on the subject, and they are fools if they are not conducting weather modification research as well. Langmuir said cloud seeding during Project Cirrus in the New Mexico desert was conducted at regular weekly intervals, and the Midwest rains began to fall weekly too. 
The scientist described another test in October of 1947 when he said a hurricane was seeded. It changed course, hitting the city of Savannah, Georgia, doing heavy damage. He said this test discouraged hurricane seeding, but he believes the work should be continued with typhoons in the South Pacific. And so within just a few years, this guy is not only discovering important facts about the binding of chemicals and chemistry and the nature of atmospheric activity of clouds and lightning and storms and even how to modify it and how to get man's intervention involved with the weather. But right off the bat, within the first few years, Irving Langmuir and who knows how many others were already advocating the use of it as an offensive weapon. James Roger Fleming, who has an MIT professorship, argues that the military regarded cloud seeding as the trigger that could release the violence of the atmosphere against an enemy or tame the winds in the service of an all-weather air force. By 1954, Harold Orville, the weather advisor to President Eisenhower, had gotten involved and was publishing articles advocating the pursuit of a weather weapon for warfare. In due time, the Army Ordnance Department was testing and investigating techniques of loading silver iodide and carbon dioxide into 50 caliber tracer bullets that could be fired from the planes into the clouds. There was another plan that he calls more insidious to strike at the enemy's food supply by seeding clouds to rob them of moisture before they reach the enemy's agricultural areas. Fleming quotes from Strategic Air Command Commander General George C. Kenney, who said, The nation that first learns to plot the paths of air masses accurately and learns to control the time and place of precipitation will dominate the globe. So what's interesting that Fleming brings up in his article is that they did indeed try to use weather modification in the war in Vietnam and the surrounding countries of Laos and Cambodia. Weather modification took a macro pathological turn between 1967 and 1972 in the jungles over North and South Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. He writes, under Operation Popeye, the Air Weather Service conducted secret cloud testing operations to reduce traffic along portions of the Ho Chi Minh Trail. They flew out of Udorn Air Base in Thailand without the knowledge of the government or basically anyone else, but President Johnson and others in the U.S. government knew all about it, and the Air Weather Service flew over 2,600 cloud seeding sorties. They used 47,000 silver iodide flares over a period of five years, and they spent less than $4 million. And the story broke in 1971 in a column by Jack Anderson confirming the use of weather modification in Southeast Asia but up until that point, they had tried to keep it a secret. They had denied it, and they were, in fact, using covert weather weapons to change the course of Vietnam. And it led to a backlash. The Senate adopted a resolution in 1973 that on paper prohibited and prevented the use of environmental or geophysical modification activity as a weapon of war, with Operation Popeye clearly in mind. In conclusion, knowledge of weather weapons has faded from the public mind or it's just considered a fantasy or a fiction, despite the fact that the startling advances in technology have made possible the almost omnipotent potential for mass destruction, not to mention at least one mad scientist with the will to use it. And there's a lot more on this topic, but just this one guy alone kind of blows my mind. But let's not forget the quote that came from 1997 during a question-answer session at the Conference on Terrorism, Weapons of Mass Destruction, and U.S. Strategy, where they put a question to former Secretary of Defense William Cohen, and he said, quote, Others are engaging in an eco-type of terrorism, whereby they can alter the climate, set off earthquakes, volcanoes, remotely through the use of electromagnetic waves. And I've looked up the transcript from this before. It's not a rumor. This is on record as being the transcript. So presumably he said it. Acknowledging from a Department of Defense point of view that weather weapons are quite real and admitting that there's a chance that terrorists or really anyone with a certain set of technology could change the climate and could weaponize it, could use earthquakes, volcanoes, and you name it to destroy people, to destroy crops, to destroy regions and countries. And it could be used to take out an enemy. And moreover, they don't have to use silver iodide and cloud seeding technology. They can now do it directly with electromagnetic waves. Just let that sink in. This is real stuff, and these people are talking about weaponizing it.